So welcome to the Andrews and Bride Session 1, Jack. And I'm Nicola, on behalf of the Oyster Catcher, we're really excited to have you here. Thank so, you. Um, just first of all, to start off, what are you reading right now and can you maybe give us a brief description of it? OK, well, I'm reading a book that I've read before, which is not something I usually do, um, because there's so many books out there that I, I don't think there's much point reading things you've read before, but I'm reading a book by an author that I'm actually, and I'm quite excited about this, I'm going to meet at Edinburgh Book Festival at the weekend, wow. and I've got the opportunity to interview her, so I thought I'd better kind of refresh my memory about mm -hmm. her books. So this book is called Half of a Yellow Sun, and the author is Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, which is a Nigerian author, and it's a book about uh, the Biafran War, the, the Nigerian Civil War, but it's also a love story, so it's, it's really good. And a bit of romance in there, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm enjoying reading that again. Um, have you read anything of hers before? I have. She's, she's written, um, I think, three novels. This one, uh, one called Americana, which is all about a, a Nigerian woman that goes to live in America. And actually, it's probably quite relevant to some of the debates in America today with a certain president. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and another one called Purple Hibiscus, which is uh, set in Nigeria again. And it's, uh, it's a story, it's quite a sad story actually about um, a, a girl who grows up with a really abusive father and it's the story of what happens to her. But she also writes a bit of uh, non-fiction. She's mm -hmm. written, well, she did a, a TED talk well, about well, why we should all be feminists and published a little pamphlet so you can read that in about 20 minutes. I think you should, Jack. Yeah. I think you should. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I recommend it, Jack. <laughs> Brilliant. So, next question. If you could be any fictional character in literary history, who would it be and why? Man or woman? Oh, that's, that's quite difficult, actually, because every time I read a book that I really enjoy, I think oh, it would be great to be that character. Um, I think probably if I had to choose one, it would be uh, the character, the main character in uh, Sunset Song, or uh, A Scots oh, Square, really? which is the, the trilogy, the Lewis Grassic Gibbon trilogy. Um, so the main character is called uh, Chris Guthrie, okay. and I would probably choose her. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, in a world where we're always on our smartphones and kind of looking at technology all the time, why do you think it would be more beneficial for teenagers to return to paper and ink instead of their, their phones? Well, I mean, I don't think we should try to turn back the, the digital tide. You know, digital is, is the future and it's really important that people, young people feel comfortable and competent using the internet and using digital. Um, but I also think, particularly for reading, and this is maybe just my personal preference, but there is no substitute for sitting with an actual paper book in your hands, mm -hmm. and it's a different experience. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I think it's important is because it encourages you to concentrate on what you're reading. I think when you're reading something on a screen, the temptation is always to flick to something yeah. else, you know, check what's happening on Twitter or check an email. Exactly. Um, so you don't concentrate on what you're reading mm -hmm. for very long, whereas if you're sitting with a book, you actually can sort of lose yourself in it. Yeah, you like and immerse yourself really into it. It's so even like holding a book and like even the smell and everything. Everything like about books. It's almost yeah, tangible, yeah. really. Yeah. Story, I love books. I mean, I, I always sort of say I, I love reading, but I love books as well. And the, the two are not absolutely the same thing. So I, yeah, I, my, my husband yeah, gets really irritated at the amount of books I buy. <laughs> so I, I buy way yeah. more books than I can ever <laughs> read. Keep up with. Um, yeah. But I, I just love collecting books. Brilliant. Um, and also, as we all know, it's really important for young people and everybody to read a variety of different genres. Um, what would you recommend for like a young, younger people in the school to read, just to um, explore books? My recommendation actually is just to, to read what you enjoy. So mm -hmm. I think it's less important what you read than the fact that you, you do read, because reading um, you know, tends to then get you interested in, in other things. My favourite genres are, uh, I like crime fiction, um, mm -hmm. but I like historical fiction as, as well. Um, and I, I try to read a lot of different things, you mm -hmm. know, not, not just one particular genre. Yeah. I think my ideal book is a book that's a really good story that you can sort of lose yourself in, but also teaches you something about, you know, a period in history or a country that you've, mm -hmm. you've never visited. Um, and so historical fiction is quite good for that. You can learn, you know, about a, a period in, in history. Um, but novels set in, in different countries that I haven't visited before. I, I like doing that yeah, as well. Exactly. Well, exactly, I've never been to Nigeria, but you know, I've yeah, learned exactly. both about a period in history and a, another country. Um, another author I'm reading a bit of just now, again, I had got the chance to meet her at the book festival last weekend, is a Turkish author called Elif Shafak, and she writes novels 
mainly based in Istanbul in, in Turkey, but it's you know, it takes you into a completely different culture. Um, so that that's what I enjoy, that combination of a really good story, but mm -hmm. learning something so about the world. Taking away from that. Like yeah. travelling without even Scotland. leaving their Well, home. you can. It's, I mean, it's, it's what people say. You can travel the world from the comfort of your own living room through books. Mm -hmm. I heard a quote, actually. It was like, people who read love a thousand lives and those who don't love one. That's a fantastic Something quote. Like that, I, I think I've heard that quote before oh, as well, but it it's absolutely, it sums up the power of reading. Mm -hmm, it really does. So when you became kind of actively involved in politics mm. in the young age of 16, so around our age, what inspired you to get to into this book in, in terms of books or, or literature or that? Well, I, I started to really love reading when I was much, much younger. So I, I've read books for as long as I can remember. So for, for as long as I've been able to read, I've enjoyed reading. So when I was really we, you know, I love you know, Blyton books, Famous Five. Um, and then probably when I was in the sort of early years of secondary school, that's when I, I read, you know, Jane Austen, uh, Emily Bronte, mm -hmm. books like, like that, books like To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, the, all the sort of great classics. Um, and these are all books that I still remember and, and, and would recommend to young people. Um, but again, I, you know, I've said before, the most important thing is to find what you enjoy. Um, I, I, I have a rule, which is a personal thing. I'm not saying it's the right way to do it. When you start a book, finish it. So I don't, I don't like certain books and then think, oh, I'm not, because some of the books I've enjoyed most um, are books that probably took me quite a while yeah, uh -huh. to I start enjoying, so maybe a quarter or halfway through. So I think if, if you don't enjoy a book in the first few pages and give up, you could be missing finding a book that you really, really love. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm a great believer that, you know, some books are better than others and some books you enjoy more than others, but most books you can get something out of, and there's, you know, not not very many really bad books out there. So um, as a politician and an avid reader, you more than anybody else will be aware of the power of words and rhetoric. So do you think that you've ever been tricked by someone's <laughs> persuasive power? <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact that you persuaded me to do this. <laughs> yes, <but> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, politics is all about trying to persuade people um, of arguments and points of view. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example where... Uh, <laughs> Don't get anyone into my, too much trouble in this. My, my, <laughs> my niece is probably the most persuasive person I know when she's Aww. trying to persuade me to buy her something or <laughs> or get her or do something with her that her mum says she shouldn't have or do. So she's pretty persuasive. I think she's a politician in the making. <laughs> so throughout your, um, throughout your life, is there any standout piece of literature that's inspired you both politically and personally? Um, lots and lots, actually. And I... I always really struggle when I, I'm asked what is my standout favourite oh. book because there's there's so many books I've read throughout the years. Um, I always probably say Sunset Song if I'm absolutely forced to because it was it was a book that you know, I read at quite a formative period and it had a big impact on me. Um, but there's been so many books. I, another one actually which we were just uh, talking about this author in the corridor, unfortunately he he's no longer with us, uh, Willie McIlvanny. Um, mm. who's, I was just saying, he, he taught at my school the year before I started, which I was always really annoyed that I'd missed having having him as an English teacher. Uh, so the book we were talking about there was Laidlaw, which is a, a book about, um, it was kind of a police crime book. But uh, I loved all of his, uh, his work. Um, so yeah, there's been so many books that have had a big impact on me. What is it about uh, crime fiction that draws you in so much? Um, I think just it's quite easy to get lost in a, a crime book and, yeah. and get absorbed in it because you know the plot tends to uh, carry you along. I try not to read too much crime, you know, because well, I enjoy it. Um, I think it's good to read other things yeah, as well. Some, <laughs> I, I think, cr although I really like crime fiction, I think it's probably you're more likely to find bad crime books than you are to find bad yeah. books in other genres. Um, so there's lots of really, really good crime fiction out there, and actually, for whatever reason, Scotland has got a lot of very, very good crime. crime. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was trying to well. be more diplomatic, um, <laughs> but possibly. <laughs> actually, I, I, I should put my First Minister's hat on and say crime is at a 43-year low in oh Scotland. Oh, really? Right? That's yes. good. <laughs> Sorry. But we've got, <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've got some great crime mm. writers, so you know, Ian Rankin, uh, Val McDermott, who's one of my personal favourites, Chris Brookmeyer. So we've got really good 
um, crime writers. I read a, a, in the, over the summer when I was on holiday, I read a really good, what would you describe it as crime, maybe? It was, it's based on a guy called Don Winslow, and he writes about the Mexican drug trade. Mm. Uh, trade. Um, and that was good because, as I was saying earlier on, it, it was kind of fast-moving book, but it also was teaching you about something that I didn't really know all that much about before. Okay. So um, we all know that you're an extremely busy person, of course. Um, but I was wondering um, how you find time for reading in your busy schedule. I don't obviously have as much time as I would like to have mm -hmm. for reading, but I, I try to read every day, at least even usually before I go to sleep at night. Uh, so even if it's quite late uh, and I'm quite tired, I try to read even just a few pages because um, I, I find it helps me switch off from other things and kind of it helps me relax and just take my mind off other things that I might be thinking about. So, so what about at work? Is there actually a book club at Holyrood? Or are you just <laughs> Not that I know of. Maybe I should set should one be. up. Right. Yeah, so but I, I don't think there is. If there was, if you had to pick five of your colleagues, you uh -huh. or maybe a couple. Uh, <coughs> I don't know. I'd be your favourite. <sighs> one. Sure, <laughs> I think what, what, what <coughs> I might do, would this be five people? Uh, I should maybe try and set up a book club with the other party leaders and the presiding officer. Okay. Well, we hope to see that in the news soon. I'll maybe try and. <laughs> yeah. We'd all, I was going to say it would, it would be better than us arguing with each other, but we'd probably very quickly start arguing about what the best <laughs> book was. <laughs> so. Sure. And uh, one of the books that we read in our curriculum is To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and as uh, Atif Atticus Finch once said, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, mm. until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. Taking all this into consideration, do you think that you can empathise with Theresa May's politics? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always thought that advice from Atticus Finch was very good advice, and politicians don't... Uh, try to see things from other people's point of view <laughs> as much as we should. Um, so it's, it's good advice. Can I sympathise with her politics? I, I can certainly see where she's coming from. Um, I guess I find it easier to sympathise with her as a human being than I do mm -hmm. with her politics. So, you know, politics can be, you know, politician, everybody's got, you know, criticisms to make of politicians, which is, is fine, but it's actually can be quite a tough thing personally because you you live your life in in the public eye and everybody's you know got an opinion on how you should be doing your job yeah, so everybody yeah. thinks they know better than you <laughs> but you're the one that has to make the decisions and and you know she's had a pretty tough tough few months Theresa May so I can probably sympathise with her mm -hmm. on on that level yeah. uh, the politics is a bit more of a challenge just before you go I've got a few kind of quick fire questions I oh I hate quick fire questions <laughs> oh <laughs> don't worry there's only a few right okay okay, okay. Gandalf or Dumbledore Dumbledore mm. Burns or Shakespeare Burns right. Jane Austen or Emily Bronte that's a hard one actually mm -hmm. uh, Jane Austen I think but that that's Kind of 50 50. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, what about uh, Caroline Duffy or Jackie Kay? Ah, Caroline Duffy's up there. Mm -hmm. I like them both, but Jackie Kay, of course, is our national poet. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. she, she's she's both a wonderful woman and an absolutely amazing writer. She just takes it and so yeah, I know this is a quick fire, but the great thing about Jackie Kay is she's a poet, um, but she also writes prose as well. And whatever uh, writing she, she does, she is phenomenal. And our last one, uh, Ruth Davidson or Kezia Dugdale? <laughs> <laughs> you need to pick, pick, one, you, need you pick have one. to. Oh no! <laughs> if you had to. So, so pass is not well. unacceptable. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh. Right, She's okay. Um, yeah. yeah. No, no, yeah. I'm going to come. See, I would pick one of them for some reasons and the other one for other reasons. Um, Kezia, probably because while we don't agree on everything, we probably agree on more than mm -hmm. Ruth and I agree on. Uh, but I suspect Ruth is probably better fun in the pub. <laughs> that's, that's fair enough. Yeah, that. Please don't Thank tell anybody I said that. <laughs> Just cut that out. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really brilliant interview. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.